Uh, all right, so uh, I'm Rebecca Brooks. I'm a graduate student, or I just wrapped up my uh, PhD at Penn and um, I'm doing a bridging postdoc at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia before starting as a scientist at Altos Lab um, this summer. So really excited to be here and meet you all. Um, before we really uh, dive into the paper, uh, where we'll sh show slides from two excellent slide decks from um, from uh, two of the participants today, um, Eric, if you would like to give a short introduction of yourself and kind of um, uh, how Dino got started, that would be awesome. Uh, sure. Yeah, and first off, thank you so much for the invitation to come uh, speak and share with you all a little about Dino's story. Um, I've interacted with the program throughout the various years, and it's really exciting to see what you're all doing, as well as to see the growth and the new people uh, coming to be part of this community. So um, let me know how I can help. Really happy to make this interactive, take questions throughout. It was already a great intro uh, to me. Um, I mean, I guess I, I, I could add a little bit more. Like as a company, we've, we've existed for a little over three years. Um, and then the time that I worked with George, that was about the four years prior. So the papers that we'll talk about today, that was like all the kind of pre-dino work, just to put it in context. And actually, um, the questions were really great. I had a chance to look them over in advance. And uh, like essentially, those two stories are what, what I wanted to do um, in order to prove to myself that this was uh, an idea that was worth working on. And, you know, find a way to tell that story. Ultimately, part of that made it into publications. Um, we've been working as a company then to take the next steps as a platform for the, for the last three uh, plus years. And I can uh, share more about that as well uh, throughout the day. So um, maybe I'll just hand it back over to you, uh, Rebecca. And uh, I'm also just taking directions. So let me know how it can be helpful. And uh, I assume that we're gonna go through the presentations first from the, from the folks who prepared this. So uh, looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the for the first half, when we really dive into the paper, um, if Praniti, you want to pull up the slides, the first half we're going to um, show Josephine's um, slides, and this really we do want these slides to to be more um, of a template for the discussion. So I don't want Josephine to feel like it's only her talking. I'd love for people to kind of um, chime in and uh, into the discussion um, as we go along. So Josephine, if you'd like to um, introduce yourself and um, yeah, and uh, give us an, give us a, a brief overview of um, the biological space that we're going to explore today. Can I, can I interrupt for just one quick thing? Sure. Fun fun fact. It's just uh, it's very funny. Um, one of my uh, co-authors on the science paper, uh, the first author, Pierce Ogden, is actually uh, sitting right there in the audience. Uh, he was also part of the nuclear program a few years ago. So. Uh, that's just a fun coincidence, given that we're talking about this paper uh, that Pierce awesome. is part of. That's awesome. He's, he's the one who's right above the capsule. Perfectly placed. Wow. Uh, all right, Josephine. Okay, thanks. Um, hi, everybody. So, um, yeah, my name is Josephine. I'm actually currently based in Heidelberg in Germany. I just moved here, but I spent the past four years in San Francisco. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm with this community now, um, which I'm very fond. I'm like keeping in touch with that community. So I think that's fun. Um, so I'm a first year PhD at the European Molecular Biology Lab. I'm specifically in the Molecular Medicine Partnership Unit. So my lab is focused on uh, yeah, epitranscriptomic mechanisms driving acute myeloid leukemia specifically. Um, and so what I'm doing is trying to find ways we can target um, chimeric antigen receptor T cells towards new um, yeah, immunotherapy targets on AML cells. So that's a bit about my background. Um, I thought the AAV capsid space, it's quite interesting because um, obviously with cell therapies, you're focusing on ex vivo engineering of cells with lentiviral vectors. So this transition to in vivo delivery, which is really what AAV cap, um, AAVs do um, is, is new to me, but it's, it's very interesting. So yeah, we can dive into the presentation to start. So yeah, I'll talk directly about the publication, which was published in 2019 um, and has formed the basis of, of yeah, your company, Eric, which is great to see. So first on the background, um, adeno-associated viruses, capsids are particularly useful for gene therapies um, because of, well, technically their structure, which is depicted there on the right-hand side, 
Um, so in simple terms, it's comprised of a genetic payload um, that's encapsulated by uh, your capsid. And the purpose of the two is are very different things. So the payload will serve to rescue your mutated or dysfunctional gene that underpins your genetic diseases. And then the capsid will serve really to uh, target their delivery payload to um, a specific tissue, which is what this paper focuses on. Um, and so because of this, there have already been a number of adeno-associated viral delivered gene therapies um, approved for clinical use. Um, however, as this paper highlights, there are still some challenges um, and they are not fully optimized. And so the image there on the right, you then um, can see a sequential like challenges along the way, but what we're going to talk about today will be specifically targeting to tissues of interest, um, which is well, yeah, what this paper addresses and also depends on the serotype, I believe. So if there's any experts out there on AAVs, you can also chime in with some more biological <laughs> um, information. <laughs> Um, and so this was a very neat picture, I think. Uh, Eric, you can also describe a bit about maybe how you took this photo and where this happened. Was it during your PhD or was this um, when you built your company? Uh, actually, the, the story behind it is it was, it's featuring the data that was in the science paper. It's the average um, fitness at each position. The, uh, I believe this is the insertions. Um, and then, you know, the, the right side is just cut halfway through the capsid to kind of show you how the cross section looks. Uh, the left side is just the outer surface. Um, and there's a similar image in the paper, um, but it's, it's, this, it's slightly different. This data is actually much cleaner because we went and did some analysis of that same data set within the company and applied some more sophisticated like ways of looking at uh, the barcodes to clean it up. And so this, this is just the most clear picture of it that then made it into our press releases when the paper came out several years later. So uh, that, that's the story behind why it looks so clean now and different than the, the actual mm -hmm. paper. Yeah, cool. It's really neat. Um, and one thing I think to point out is that every every ball will, is essentially representing one amino acid, right? Or one protein? Yeah, yeah. each each bubble is an, uh, an atom. It's just the surface um, filling representation. And so, okay. you know, multiple different close by ones will make up each amino you know, acid. It's kind of hard to tell at this scale. Um, yeah. Cool. But what this represents too is quite, which is quite neat, I think, is that a lot of times you're focusing on engineering one specific protein or like amino acid, whereas this is really looking at like the formation of multiple and interaction of mul how multiple different amino acids come together and like more really multiplex engineering a technology. So, yeah, you can move to the next slide. Um, so to me, the technology at least can be broken down into three different components. Um, and so in the first, the goal was to create this diversified library um, of different variants of the AAV2 serotype, which is for proof of concept, probably quite one of the most studied ones, I think so far, is that correct? Um, and so for this, you really used like you maximize the sequence diversity by two methods. So one was random mutagenesis and then also single site directed, directed mutants um, to build this library. And then in the next component, you, multi yeah, you performed multiplex measurements of in vivo biodistribution. So essentially in, in mice, which is really a, a translational component of this technology. And also very neat that you couple the experimental designs together with the computational um, uh, designs as well. And then in the third, you then basically take, from what I understand, I'm not a computational expert, but you take the output data from these first two stages and um, build or train a model to enable this machine guided design of AAV capsids, which will technically then propose even more new sequences that you can test. I want to like take a take a step back here and and maybe if anybody has questions or, or comments on how these AV2 libraries kind of came to be or, or perhaps um, Eric, if you want to make a comment, is, is it like maybe how um, this study was originally um, thought thought about and and did you know or did you have any um, I, I know in the paper it seemed like there was a little bit of a surprise of the capacity for the organ tropism uh, 
but yeah, if we want to, um, anybody have any question and, and Eric, if you want to comment a little bit more on, on, on how um, these studies were originally designed. Um, maybe I'll comment a little about AV2. First off, okay. that was a great summary, Josephine. Um, uh, very accurate. And uh, so I'll try to, I guess, fill in the details maybe that aren't in the paper in case that might be relevant for you. I always feel like every paper has a fun backstory. Yeah. Um, and I never had the chance to share more of these uh, like insights uh, with others. So AV2, uh, it's, it's kind of like the model organism for AVs in that um, it's very easy to work with it. You know, we know the properties in vivo. We also, it works well in, in cell culture, can transfect cells quite efficiently, whereas some of the other serotypes that work well in vivo aren't very good at transfection in vitro. So um, chose it because it was like the best studied, had the most prior mutations we could look at from our data set and reference back to other papers and just to see if they matched, as well as um, understand the best about how tropism is determined at a mechanistic level, for example, like specific regions of the capsid which bind to heparin uh, that's related to the liver tropism. Um, so, because we, we're developing new technology, anticipating that reviewers might ask like, how do you even know this data makes sense? And so we wanted to be able to kind of cross-reference with other papers to show that there was what we expected there and then uh, that the new stuff was therefore meaningful. Um, and then it also has clinical utility. Uh, it's, it's actually AV2. It's the most commonly studied one. AV1 was the first one studied, um, but there's not as much, I guess, like useful about AV1 or, or not as much that we know yet. Uh, AV2 was part of the first FDA approved gene therapy, Luxterman, which is a, uh, a therapy for the eye. So it was also part of the motivation that not only would this be interesting from a scientific level, but could actually you know, be relevant to take these same libraries or same methods and then have something that's one step closer, closer to being clinically uh, useful. So that was the kind of thought process that went into choosing this as the starting serotype. That's really cool. From, from uh, the get-go, from, from even like um, in, when you're first designing these assays, did you know you were going to go from point mutations to then try to multiplex and, and do multiple mutations? Yeah, I did. Um, so to say why, um, actually for my PhD, I did a very similar systematic scan of a different protein. Um, more to study the basic biology in E. coli. It was an essential gene. Um, so I was pretty familiar with that type of data format and had just been staring at these types of heat maps for a long time. So I could very quickly like recognize that's a noisy data set or that, that makes sense. There's some interesting signal there. Um, as well as like my, my original background before uh, systems biology, as you know, I, I was uh, studying physics so I just like the elegance of all the first order changes. It's like the simplest possible model. If you want to learn the most you can from a small number of mutations, then that's a good way to start. And it, it also just visualizes nicely. So the data sets, once you start to make multiple mutations all together, it becomes really hard to explain to others like what this is. So having something that was you know, easily communicated was, was also a goal. Um, Externally, and then as I said, internally, like you, you, you want to make sure that there's real signal in the data before you begin to go even more complex. So it was like um, what I thought would be the this fastest way to develop the method, starting with something that was a little more well understood, easier to interpret, um, and then use that to inform the more complex libraries, which is essentially what the right figure shows: is going from the single mutations to then use very simple models, but now to explore making multiple mutations on top of that same background. And we've tried all sorts of ways to visualize that. None of them are all that satisfying <laughs> still. So you kind of just have to abstract it away and let, yeah. let the models take care of it for you. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, one thing that I started thinking about, and uh, other people definitely feel free to put, chime in with questions, but well, you know, in the, within this space, I, I'm relatively new to, to learning about this space. Um, do you ever worry that an organ tropism in a mouse might not translate to humans? Can you comment a little bit on, on, on how, how that's worked throughout? It's not, not, not just something that 
I worry about, but it's something that we're, we're very much aware as a field that um, tropism is different between species. Uh, and that's just an evolution of a gradual progression. Initially, people made better AV vectors in vitro, and then those didn't translate well in vivo in animal models. And then there was a shift to focus on in vivo in animals, and then, for example, selecting better AVs in mice some really well-known ones that had a lot of promise. Um, PHPB is a good example that uh, was a really nice publication of a new method. Amazing in mice, but in that did it translate into primates, especially based upon tests in non-human primates uh, like monkeys. Um, so the field has really shifted towards uh, non-human primate studies as the gold standard for safety, certainly before going into human gene therapies. And then ideally also you can see efficient delivery um, in, in those animals, uh, especially in larger animals, because that's again gonna be more similar uh, to delivery in humans. And there might be a future to go beyond that too, um, because there's still gonna be differences between monkeys and humans. And the question is how to build a better model. And it, um, so many, many interesting ideas out there. Mm -hmm. I am most optimistic that, um, that we're, we're going to do that primarily by combining data across multiple different types of models. So say like a, a non-human primate, you could test in multiple different species. And if something works across all those, then it's more likely to translate into humans. Or you could take a look at what works there. And then also with some uh, cell culture model, say like an explant organ or human cells and you know, do further de-risking that it works in primates and then also happens to work in these other human specific cell systems. And by integrating across all that data, um, de-risk translation into humans. And that, that's another one of the uh, reasons why I was so excited about this data-driven approach is that no model is going to be perfect, but by bringing it all into the data layer, now you can pay attention to the data that's most meaningful to predict uh, translation. And you don't have to worry about how to build the perfect like physical model. You just need to know how to analyze data across multiple models. Yeah, that's really that's really awesome. I think too. I think this is such a cool application of demonstrating the utility of a machine guided methodology to really explore that space and, and to explore what you can actually know in that space before thinking about different models. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, Josephine, if you want to go ahead and, and uh, take us take us into since I think we've already started discussing a little bit. Um, about the, the validation. Oh, we have um, John Beekman at right, Raise His Hand. If you want to go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, hey, um, I'm John. I'm a, I just graduated from Penn. Now I'm a postdoc at Yale. Um, I did want to ask Eric, it's, I, I love the kind of random mutagenesis and then big data uh, approach. And I'm wondering if you had in the past um, experience with the more like hypothesis driven targeted mutagenesis approach or considered it and, and uh, what the thought process was there? Certainly thought about it a lot. There's kind of two camps of protein engineering um, that have been really popular. The directed evolution camp, which is large libraries often randomly uh, generated, which is really optimizing for quantity, but the quality is generally low. because you can see like this heat map on the right, most mutations are blue, which is broken. So if you randomly choose a point, usually it breaks. And if you choose multiple points, then um, it's even more likely to be broken, which is exactly what we were testing in kind of this, this right experiment. Um, so you, you could take another approach. You could optimize for quality instead. And the way that people have done that is often by this rational design. Like, let's look at the literature. Let's try to understand the mechanism. Let's even model you know, the entire protein with some molecular dynamics. The challenge is that even when you know a lot about the protein, it's really hard. Like it's hard to model proteins from first principles. Even if you know the folding, it's not obvious like how a certain change is gonna affect the function. So um, even in the best cases, like rational design is still like an intuition to guide your guesses. You can't you know, have perfect predictivity. And then the other challenge specific to AV is that the protein is very complex. It's at the upper end of like complexity in contrast to the more simple proteins because it's 60 monomers that come together. And then there's also just a lot of biological unknowns. Like we don't know all the receptors that AV interacts with or the differences between um, 
you know, uh, different tissues uh, that would also affect tropism. And it's probably going to take years before we gain a better understanding of that. And meanwhile, we don't want to wait for that because we need better vectors now for patients. So um, what the reason why I was really excited about AV as a model, I, I was finishing up my PhD, as I mentioned, applying similar types of technologies and looking for a protein that would really benefit from this ability to generate large libraries. And um, the, the promise is that you can get the best of both worlds. You can learn a lot from the data and thereby increase the quality of the, your guesses, just like rational design. But now you can do that at scale because you can generate huge amounts of data. And then that, that data enables you to get more data. So that's how you can get the quantity up. So both high quantity, high quality is kind of the new thing, the new thing that is different than directed evolution and rational design. And you know, we just called it machine guided design. Uh, so definitely considered it and was inspired by it. And there, there's also all sorts of other, there were indications that putting more information into the design of libraries was, was valuable. For example, like more recently, there's even been other companies founded around the idea of incorporating structure into the design or incorporating the ancestral phylogeny into the design. So that, that that seemed to be beneficial, made me feel like having even more data would be even, even better. So that, that was kind of how I thought about the early days of the project, why this was a promising direction. Well, yeah, on, on that note, actually, that I think that's a good question, John. I was also interested because you technically were combining a rational design together because you you kind of you limited the mutations to a 28 amino acid target region, right? So to some extent, you're using biology already to inform and limit your your target region where you perform these mutations. Is that kind of is that correct? Or because there is there should be a limit to also how much like I guess there's also a limit to how much you can exponentially increase your sequence diversity. Yeah, it's really just a, like finding the right way to tell the story. So the there's a length limitation of variants that can be synthesized. Um, so we had to you know focus on a specific region of the capsid, and then the question is which region. So we chose a region that was more well studied where it had some of those variants that you know we could look up and people knew what their behavior was supposed to be for example at this 588 position there's a, a change um, that stops the av2 from going to the liver which is very well studied and people understand kind of what it binds to that causes that that's the heparin binding region so that that was one reason why we focused on this 588 and then we there were many other things that were considered too like we wanted it to somehow like be representative to not be like the easiest possible thing to do. So try to find a region that had stuff that we knew about, but then also, um, you know, at the external portions of the capsid, those are easier to make mutations. They're more tolerant. So we also wanted to include some varied positions and some conserved positions. And in other words, just from looking at one region to be able to say, yeah, in general, this is going to work fine. You know, no matter which region you would choose, and that that's just storytelling. Uh, and in fact, that's that's what we've done now um, at Dino. Subsequent to the paper being published, is apply the same types of methods, but now scanning across all positions. And I wouldn't say that you know there was anything noticeably different. Uh, the same things work no matter where you choose for the reasons that you know I mentioned. This this region is kind of representative. That's awesome. Rachel has a question. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Rachel Candle. I'm a PhD student at UCSD um, and a fellow at a venture capital fund called Vita Ventures. Um, I had a question. I don't want to skip too far ahead from the paper into the company, but I guess I'm going to do that. Um, I noticed it. So in the paper, it seemed like the mutation library was applied, you know, either to biodistribution or to thermostability, like looking at one aspect. Um, obviously, don't tell me anything that is confidential for the company, but when you partner with a pharma company, is it generally the understanding being that you'll look at multiple aspects, like engineer this in several ways, or you generally try to design an AAV for a specific use that's um, engineered towards one function, like specifically for biodistribution? Uh, it's a great question. And, and yeah, don't be shy about asking me questions. Actually, one thing that is um, like notable if you're thinking about like strategies for startups is actually all this data that was 
published in these papers uh, is, is stuff that I was talking about publicly at conferences, like in the years before the company was founded, even before anything was published, which was kind of a risk because, you know, maybe we're going to get scooped, but I guess like, I felt that we needed to move quickly if we wanted to um, advance the field. And these ideas were going to eventually bubble up through other places too, if we didn't. So better to get out there first, like telling the story and then use that momentum to get people on our team, get partners excited. Uh, and in the end, that, that's, that's what happened. We were able to uh, attract a lot of interest from sharing this type of data. The conferences, which led to discussions that then became our first partnerships, as well as you know, all this data that we had talked about we're sharing prior to publication was what helped convince people to join the team early on. Um, and then to, to get to the question, Rachel, about the, um, the different types of measurements, the, the paper kind of tells a story that here's this library, here's these different ways of reading out from the library. And the point really being that we can measure all these different things, you know, whatever you care about, we could design an assay to measure it in high throughput. So the way that translates into action at Dino is there's many different properties that are important for in vivo delivery, but not a huge number. The efficiency of delivery, the specificity to target cells or organs, uh, avoiding the immune system, existing immunity, for example, which looks like we're gonna talk about later, packaging size and manufacturability. It's really just those five things and some combination of those that defines an ideal profile for a uh, capsid. That of course depends on which organ you're going into, which cell type and which disease uh, you're, you're gonna treat. Um, but we think about it in this concept of uh, capsid profile. So it's some like vector in that multidimensional space, anything further along that vector is better. And we use that vector representation in looking for the improved variance, measure across the different properties that are relevant and then combine those together into one score and ask the machine learning to optimize in that direction. Uh, that's, you know, the simplest way of thinking about this. Some other things that you can do too, though, if you want to like learn more about each dimension independently and then try to combine that together in later rounds, that's an interesting strategy. But um, I think in principle, we haven't really figured out what's the optimal way to do that. That's another thing that we do is just part of the research uh, part of the company. Thank you. Yeah, this is awesome. So during during this slide, I think for the pre work, we had people particularly think about during the validation process um, the particular controls that were used in the in the model system and the importance of those controls. Eric, were there any controls that you were particularly adamant about including um, for, for these experiments, and and maybe even things that you would go back and add now? Yeah, well, negative and positive controls. I was pretty adamant about those. Um, which is, which is actually something that you, you don't get all that well if you um, do random libraries. So that's a nice thing about the synthesis as well is you can really think about how you're gonna recognize signal and build that in to the design of the synthesized variants. So for us, the negative controls were stop codons, stop codons that we know are gonna break the packaging. Those happen in the structural regions of the caps of the VP3 region. Mm -hmm. There's also some other negative controls for transduction since the VP1 region is essential for transduction. We didn't end up using those in the paper because we published just around the biodistribution, but we use those internally now when we're measuring transduction in the company. And then the positive controls are the wild type replicates or even the synonymous variants with wild type, depending on if, if you count those. Um, and of course those should have um, a viable phenotype no matter where you look. Um, and if you see a separation between those, that's how you know that there's signal in the library, either at the production uh, measurement or later on in the different like uh, functional like delivery measurements, like tropism, say. Um, so yeah, I think that's really important. There's other controls that are embedded in it as well. I alluded to that earlier. For example, we have multiple different copies of each barcode, and that's that's the way in which we cleaned up that data set um, that I mentioned previously on the structure was by looking at those different replicates and using that to enhance our measurement of the signal. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right, Josephine, you want to take us into now that the system, um, it, you know, we were able to see that this is really beautifully validated. Now, uh, kind of taking us further into the discussion to talk about application. Yeah, perfect. I can do that. Um, on the next slide, or shall we go through? Yeah, let's do that. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, we can move on from that. So 
the yeah in terms of validation there were two further publications that these were released in 2021 so probably a year after the the dino was founded um and you know just from a brief description of the titles it seems like the first here on the left was really expanding the kind of the application. So not looking at tissue specificity specifically, but also looking at one of the other challenges with AAV therapies, which is the uh, immune evasion um, and not hyperactivating the immune system and causing an immune response, um, but still applying the machine learning approach. Um, and on the right-hand side, the machine learning approach is also further improved, I believe, um, to even further deeply diversify the AAV capsid protein. And yeah, I'm not sure in if this would then include expanding it to different serotypes or different regions or target regions or, or across different tissues. Um, yeah, so maybe, but yeah, I'm interested to hear, well, A, also these, were these, this work in progress during the founding and the starting of the company with some of those company goals in mind as, in, in mind as well? Um, and also, yeah, how has this led to the applications that are there today. Well, the um, the left paper is uh, was written by myself and other co-authors, uh, all of whom uh, work for Dino. So it was the first like Dino only uh, publication, and it's a review, uh, and it's more forward looking of a review. Like you know, here's what people have thought about, and here's how there's a new opportunity to use these new technologies like machine learning to um, improve delivery for gene therapy. Um, but it's it's kind of similar to one of the other um, reviews that was referenced earlier. This was just like putting the ideas down and kind of painting the picture for what the future looks like, which is, it's a nice opportunity to tell that story because it helps us to internally define the vision and then helps us to share that with others who might want to join or might be inspired by this to go off and do new things with it. The right paper is just the second, call it half of what we did at Harvard. Um, and it was, uh, so all that work was completed um, experimentally while at, half, while at Harvard, and then some of the data analysis and writing of the paper happened later on. It just takes some time before these things come out uh, in the publication record. Um, the, you know, the first half was in that science paper, developing the measurement technology, the ability to make libraries large scale with DNA synthesis, and then to measure them with um, DNA sequencing, and then to use that to make more complex libraries. Um, and it was just it's kind of, um, I wouldn't say an accident, but it, it wasn't the original plan to put that last figure in the paper. Um, that was there because we had been talking about this stuff. I've been talking about it at conferences. So like people kind of knew that both these things were out there and the editor really wanted some machine learning to go in the science paper because he knew this thing was coming out or somehow he heard about it from one of the reviewers or something. Um, and we didn't want to put it in because this other paper was going to be all about machine learning and we didn't want to scoop ourselves because um, this paper wasn't re yet ready for publication. Um, there was still this like this third data set that was coming out. So we ended up, there were kind of three libraries, the singles and then a deep library and then an even deeper library. We ended up talking about a little bit of the first, that middle library, the deep one, in the last figure of the science paper. But it was more of a teaser to say, there's something interesting here. And we didn't want to put everything in there because we wanted to save more of that for the second follow-up paper. And that is using more sophisticated machine learning models. We ended up, you know, we used very simple ones to design the first deep library. The question is, now that you have a complex data set, it's the type of data that machine learning is going to be um, more useful for, um, then how much better can you go? How much deeper can you go? Um, and so that was uh, the, the entire focus of this right paper is deep diversification, meaning how, how much can we change? Can we change almost every position? And the answer is with machine learning that we can. Um, and then just some other, I guess, surprises in analyzing that data, even how to think about diversity in new ways is what came out of that. Um, and then, yeah, that, that was probably a year, maybe more than a year after the first paper. So in, in the end, it worked out, but um, it was a little bit of a change of the first story because of trying to get that in uh, at the very end um, while still keeping this, this other exciting story uh, moving along. 
May I ask, um, at what point did you start patenting your technology and ideas? Like, I guess you also would patent the applications as you thought of them, like pre-publication or after publication. Um, how, how, how did you start doing that? Yeah, well, all the work that was done at Harvard, we, you know, obviously we talked to the tech transfer office. Uh, I actually went to work at the VIS Institute specifically because they had a really good um, culture and a, a focus on spinning out companies doing translational science. And so they had their own kind of business team and IP team uh, specifically for their work. So I, I was really fortunate to get to work with those folks. Um, the, you know, you have to like balance all these different factors in uh, science always. And then especially as you're doing science with the goal of doing business. Um, so IP is something I thought about a lot. And you have to ask yourself like, what, what am I trying to achieve with this IP? Am I trying to have IP I can show to investors that there's something proprietary here? Do I have the invention in my hand that I want to protect? Or is it going to come out actually several years later? Um, how worried am I that someone else might invent the same thing or create some prior art that might make it harder to get that invention in the meantime? So balancing all those at the time, um, which we first started talking about this, which was 2018, that, that's when the first uh, like public presentation was made. I felt like we were um, pretty far ahead on the methodology. Um, but there was still a lot of work to do. It was most likely going to happen somewhere else, say in a company. Um, meanwhile, nothing was published. So we tried to like balance all these different things and we filed our provisional patent applications the day of the, um, the presentation. And that was pre being prepared for many, many weeks. Um, but, you know, filing it before we did the presentation enabled us to then go talk about it publicly to have that priority date in case we ever needed it. Um, and then, you know, that, that's, of course, IP that we were very interested in. We started the company in, in having access to. So we, we worked something out with Harvard uh, as, uh, as part of setting up the company. Yeah, really cool. Uh, we, let's go ahead and uh, move to the next slide, just being cognizant of time to make sure we have uh, time for, our, for all the questions. All right, go ahead, Josephine. All right, yeah, so I think um, we already touched on a lot of these points and it's related to the application of it. So uh, generally, this is a platform and it can really produce a systematic optimization of natural capsids into synthetic variants, not just for enhanced properties in terms of targeting specific tissues, but also um, the other components that go into the gene therapy, such as the, um, the, yeah, the immune innovation that we talked about, you know, the packaging size in AVs, or it's quite limited, it's like 1.4 KBs too, so optimizing the DNA payload that gets delivered as well. Um, and I think that's also reflected by the, the number of different partners that you have on the right, which are not all just working on AAV2, they're also working on other serotypes and other tissues and like neurology. Um, I know you mentioned Luxterna, but there's, um, what's the other, Novartis's one is quite popular. Um, so yeah, but I think uh, Jonathan will talk about those later on in the second half. <laughs> Um, and then I would also love to hear everyone's ideas for the other applications. So I can just suggest one thing that I thought of um, since I work a lot with uh, tumor specific antigens and a lot of the challenges with immunotherapies there is that, you, that a lot of patients relapse or develop resistance to immunotherapies because um, of either antigenic escape or because, um, you know, as cancer is highly proliferative and then you have a lot of mutations uh, that occur at the individual patient level, which might confer resistance to the immunotherapy, or in this case, as one paper suggests, um, is to change the expression of the target that you need to bind to immunotherapy. And so for that, there has been, I think there was one paper I found that created an antibody that challenges the variations in different structures and single nucleotide polymorphisms that could arise from um, like evolving cancers at the different patient levels. So I think that having you know, such a, a random mutagenesis platform with single mutations where you can really challenge the, the system and the variants that can be produced, you could essentially create, essentially create this universal um, antibody um, and the, the, you would have a, yeah, a lower risk of patients relapsing and developing resistance to, to immunotherapies, in my opinion. That could be a cool application in my field. Yeah, thanks so much, Josephine. 
I think I, I'd love to hear um, uh, if other people have, have questions about applications. Oh, uh, we have Brian raised his hand. Uh, yeah, thank you. So yeah, my name is Brian. Uh, I'm a former process engineer, viral vector <clears throat> process engineer and data scientist. Um, and I worked at Juno and at Bluebird on uh, things like a Beckman and Brianzi. And now uh, I'm a student at UCSD as part of the Center for, uh, it's a kind of a mouthful, nano immuno engineering. Um, and I also work on um, capsid technologies and protein engineering, but for non-viral gene delivery. So a little bit of a competing um, technology. Uh, my question is, is uh, it's kind of a dark horse question. You know, do you use any kind of training data to optimize your platform for large scale AAV production for um, kind of your partners developing therapeutics? And my, my follow-up question to that is, um, is the platform modular in that it can be produced in newer manufacturing um, platforms like uh, some companies in stealth are using uh, plants um, in order to grow up uh, AAV, recombinant AAV? Um, yeah, I'm just would love to hear about those applications. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I'd be very excited about any company finding new ways to make more AV, uh, like you alluded to. Um, with regard to like whether you could use the platform uh, to optimize there, uh, in most cases, yeah, you can. Uh, you have to solve some very like esoteric problems about how to link the barcode abundance to the, the measurement that you're trying to make. So in other words, if there's some way to do a selection such that, you know, there's a function you want to uh, assess and that turns into the barcode being present or absent in the sample, then you can measure it in multiplex, meaning in high throughput with the sequencing as the readout. For example, you know, and this is as I was thinking about what's like the protein that we can make the most impact on with these technologies. Capsids are almost you know built for it because you want to measure something about the protein, right? And but you need to do that at the DNA level. Well, capsids, if they function, then the, the genome package is inside the protein. And then wherever the protein goes, the genome falls. So you get that natural linkage between the protein and the DNA built into the, the you know the capsid itself. So that enables you to then go measure, you know, packaging, production, purification. If you want to modify the process of production, say doing a you know, extra filtration step or, you know, checking where you get the most caps that is in the cells, is in the media, is some other fraction. Just by separating those different parts and sequencing them separately, you can measure all sorts of, um, you know, new, new aspects of, that phenotype. And then the same thing for we inject AVs systemically into the blood and which organ did they go into? You just kind of isolate the AV that came from each of those different, look that went to each of those locations. And now you have all this uh, measurement. So that's what I really was so excited about with capsids is that the things that you care about most are almost like built into the system to be able to measure them in high throughput. There's other ways of doing this for other proteins or you just have to be more clever to somehow link the DNA to the protein or to find other ways to read out from proteins in, in higher throughput. Um, but in, in general, I would say like multiplex measurement is the future of protein engineering. Engineering using data as your guide is, is you know, is gonna become more and more popular. You might use simple models, you might use sophisticated models, but in any case, I think you want to use all the data you possibly can, all the information you possibly can to, to guide that engineering. And more and more, the you know, the majority of the information is going to come through like data itself rather than any like mechanistic insight that we have. Just because you can build really good models, make good predictions, despite that you don't they don't understand how things work at a mechanistic level. So I, I, I liked the example that Josephine put up here of you know something completely different, different protein, but still uh, the, you know, shows you how general these machine guided methods could be applied to, to practically any sequence that you want to engineer. Yeah, it's really incredible. Do you, from the from the very get go, uh, it, early um, in this project, did you know that you wanted Dino to kind of focus more on uh, the platform and really being able to think of all of these different ways? that machine guided 
um, technology could be applied? Or did you have a particular application that you had in mind as, as maybe like uh, more of like a product focus? Yeah, I really wanted this to be a platform, which was not a popular uh, model for many venture capitalists because they are more used to um, you know, biotechs that have platforms, but then, okay, you got to help some patients. So who is that going to be? And oftentimes it's hard to find partners who want to take on the heavy lifting themselves because they don't understand the platform. They might think it's riskier. So what often happens is those companies that are therapeutically focused with platforms, they have to do the, the initial work themselves. So they focus in order to be more effective, focus on a lead product. And investors tend to value companies based upon those products, future addressable markets and how far you and how close you are to, to helping them. That's how they value the company. That's a traditional biotech model. Um, so if you say, well, this is a platform company, we're actually not going to develop products. We're going to work with partners um, like that. That met with some skepticism. And it, it just, I think, took work to show that, you know, the reason I was so excited about that, you know, took, took me some time to be able to f effectively tell that story. So, you know, one, one insight is that when talking to investors, like them saying no is not a bad thing. It just might mean that you're not, you're not telling the story in a way that makes sense to them or that kind of like, um, you know, speaks to what's different here. And that can also be really effective once you do find a way to tell the story, because obviously if everyone's doing the same thing, then there's no opportunity because you're no different than anyone else. So, you know, hundred people could be doing the same thing and what's the chances are that you'll succeed one, one out of a hundred. Um, so doing something different is actually really key if, um, if you want to create new opportunity. And if your investors, you know, somehow feel like they have a unique insight that enables them to see that difference. Now it's a good opportunity for them. Similarly, like if you're doing it different, but all the investors see the opportunity the same, then they're all competing. And now there's much less value to the investors because, you know, the market kind of equilibrates and there's, you know, essentially to the point where there's very little return for investors mm -hmm. because so many people want to participate. So they're really looking, really looking for opportunities where they're uniquely able to see the value and no one else can. And they come in early and support that. And then you share in the value that's created. So, you know, what's, what's different here is that there's many companies doing gene therapies. They all need better vectors. They're like basically uh, competing against each other with almost the same product and the vector is the big thing that makes a difference for them. That's yeah. very different than it was 10, 15 years ago. Like 10, 15 years ago, it was hard to start a gene therapy company. Now there's many every, you know, every month. Furthermore, there's many investors funding those companies, telling them go as quickly as you can. So if we're to offer them like uh, an AV capsid, which is a pretty familiar entity, easily fits into their manufacturing pipeline, you know, all we really need to do is send them an email. They could use our product. That's amazing in terms of a tech transfer process. Furthermore, AVs well understood regulatory, right? Um, insurance even is like more familiar now with reimbursement. So a lot of things have changed in the recent few years. Um, there's this competitive pressure and we offer you know, a partner something that gives them a much higher chance of success. Primarily we're incentivized towards the downstream um, you know, mutual success. They're gonna help patients, then it's gonna get milestones and royalties as part of that. Um, so there's very like, um, it's very easy to sign up for that if you feel that it's going to make the product more likely to succeed. And furthermore, we're applying these new technologies, which our partners are not going to be able to do themselves. So if, if they believe this is the right approach, you know, this is compelling, then Dino offers us something that they won't be able to do, you know, faster than they could, certainly. And it makes sense to, to partner up together. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I, and I would just say that the final thing is like, what's, what's our mission as a company? We want to maximize our impact on patients. And so by, by being a platform, we can work with many and be a multiplier on the entire field. Whereas doing products, it's really hard to do more than one and be successful. So the, the other way I you know, finally found it 
more effective to talk to investors is to say, yeah, you could do it that way, but this we feel it's the bigger opportunity, and, and here's why. And then that that eventually worked once it had you know more practice uh, knowing how to hit the right buttons. Yeah, awesome. Um, uh, Jalzi has uh, raised his hand. I had a question before we go into future directions and hand it over to to Jonathan for even going further into to this like value creation discussion. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh uh, yeah, uh, I'm Xiaojie so of XZ. Sorry, I'm sorry. For using XZ, okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm a grad student uh, at Caltech and I work in uh, AV engineering lab, the Gardner lab at Caltech. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, as Eric just mentioned, there are numerous players in the gene therapy field right now, and, uh, and many of them are focusing on developing the downstream real gene therapy products that go to the clinic. And uh, I guess as a as a platform company that just started with uh, with uh, limited resource, you will probably need to pick or uh, choose to focus on uh, target some of the partners instead of the others. And I guess I I'm wondering how do you choose or um, yeah, how, how do you uh, pick your focus uh, to partner with whom and uh, uh, focus on which kind of disease or uh, target organs? What's your rationale there? Yeah, it's a great question, thanks. Shadra, um, actually, I know Shadra's work uh, very well from Compass presentation, so it's great to see you uh, here. Um, th there's no right answer to this. Uh, I can say that the way we thought about it for our early partners is we really value the relationship. Um, so wanting to work with folks who are very experienced was important to us, um, obviously who are committed to developing products that are going to go hate patient, help patients. Um, so, you know, we ended up uh, succeeding really well working with Novartis and Sarepta as our first partners, and then Roche as our third and Estellas as our fourth, you know, all of whom uh, have really like uh, capable advanced teams. Um, Novartis acquired Avexis, which made the second FDA approved gene therapy, and Roche acquired Spark, which made the first one. So, those teams are also embedded within the folks that we work with. Um, really value their relationship too, because we get information coming back from our partners about what they're looking for, but also like this specific features that, um, you know, the specific requirements of what a capsule needs to be in order for them to move it along different stages. And those help us to understand the field more broadly. So it's both a combination of like, information coming back, which will keep us pointed in the right direction, such that we can then help more companies in the future, as well as those first partners that we work with. They're very committed, they're very capable. They're gonna help us uh, prove that the better capsids are effective by you know, um, bringing that into clinical trials and, and testing in humans. So that, that's how we thought about the, the first partnerships. In the long term, though, we, we do aim to work with everyone. We wanna enable anyone who is working on gene therapies to make better therapies. And that means we'll have to solve for some unique, um, some other unique you know, challenges. Like what do we do say to help those who are at the very early stage, who are not very large pharmaceutical companies, but who are just getting started. Can we find a way to help more of them with a structure that works for them? Or how do we help academics who are you know, interested in developing at an even earlier stage? Uh, to work with uh, you know, vectors that might then someday in the future turn into products carried forward in academia or you know, transferred uh, into industry. So those are the um, things we're thinking about in terms of the future partnership strategy. We have a whole group, the way we interface with partners is through a group we call partner success, which is thinking about what happens after business development does a deal, then we you know, work with partners in order to help them succeed. So we, we have thoughts about how to you know, work with a whole diverse uh, set of folks uh, in order to achieve this mission. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Josephine, you want to close this out in future directions for this half, and then we'll hand it over to Jonathan for thinking even more deeply about uh, company structure. Yeah, I mean, now we're on the business discussion already. Maybe we could just skip this. I feel like this is redundant anyways. We've talked about the machine learning breadth and depth, and then just how you went from the paper to your company, um, expanding your focus areas beyond tissue targeting, and then expanding the library even further, um, and creating more machine learning models and artificial intelligence. Is that yeah, if that's basically the summary of, of 
what changed from the paper versus the company you formed today. And yeah, and then we can move on to Jonathan maybe. <laughs> Uh, I think it was, it was okay. Yes, I have a question about the future directions and application. And uh, hi, everyone. I am Özge. Uh, I'm a neurobiologist by training, and currently I'm working at the intersection of both uh, science and business. Uh, I'm a new ventures associate in UMass Medical School. And I just want to ask one uh, a little bit more scientific, and also it could be a business uh, question. So is this machine learning approach can be integrated with the um, uh, to solve a tissue-specific problem with cell type specific promoter selection to define the transduction of the target cell types? Or can you integrate a peptide insertions uh, to overcome the blood bar barrier or any kind of uh, uh, for target, anti um, um, target antigen presenting cells? So this could be implementing or this is like thought like a uh, non-viable idea. Just want, I'm just wondering. Those are, those are great ideas and, and all of them are possible. Um, you, know, you can do the selection of those uh, libraries built, say, inserting at different positions. It's a very popular approach. Of course, it's also possible to do that by synthesis in, uh, in very unique ways. Um, and then on the readout side, yes, you could you could couple the barcodes to expression from a cell-specific promoter, say, to get different dimensions, not just at the organ level, but it, you know within the tissue, different cell types and how they're being expressed. And that, that's something that we and, and many others are working on. Thank you, Eric. Awesome. Jonathan, if you want to, um, I think if you already, you already introduced yourself, but you can go ahead and take us, take us into thinking about, um, thinking about Dino. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm John. I'll just a quick reintroduction. Um, I'm a postdoc in neuroscience and I'm uh, pretty naive to all this, so I feel like my role here is to maybe uh, put forward my naive impression and then tee it up for Eric to correct me with his his expertise. Um, but I'll just uh, start off with um, my impression of one of the big challenges to AAV gene therapy seems to be um, the scalability of production of, of uh, AAVs either uh, to both make it gene effect, uh, cost effective and pure. Um, and a lot of my impressions of this are from that review that I listed in the bottom right there um, that just maybe um, it seems like a lot of the, the production right now is using like hex cells or some other uh, mammalian cell. Um, and then maybe a next step for the field will be uh, improving that production. But um, here's the first, first uh, time I'll pause and let Eric maybe correct me or offer his additional opinions. <laughs> Sounds great. You're all correct. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, uh, any of these challenges, like it's very clear from all of this, the the dramatic promise of uh, AV gene therapies. I'll just throw in um, where I'm most interested in this is as a neuroscientist. Um, uh, my project before grad school was a gene therapy for Parkinson's disease using AV2. So this, this uh, struck close to home as being uh, really valuable. Um, but this figure on the bottom right just shows the broad applicability of AVs to targeting gene therapies to different tissues um, and with different um, functions to either replace, add, silence, edit genes, at kind of anything that you could imagine there. Um, and maybe we can go to the next slide because I think that that um, wide scope of applicability is best captured in just the dramatic uh, scope of the clinical trials currently in progress. This is from that same review from 2019. So a little out, outdated, but you can see um, the, the many different tissues being targeted with the varying serotypes, uh, serotypes to treat uh, many different diseases. Um, in different in different uh, phases of of progress there, um, yeah, and then great. So um, here's where I'll really tee it up for Eric because um, it feels you know I don't want to speak to their business model, but it seems like from their from their website um, that really and and Eric just kind of mentioned this that uh, it's it's primarily looking to. Uh, focus on on optimizing that AAV capsid and then partner with other gene therapy companies that are um, themselves focused on uh, de developing the therapy to target specific diseases. But Eric, I'll let you go from there. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And um, maybe I'll just walk through the different partnerships and say a little more about what we've uh, shared we're working on with them. Uh, Novartis, uh, we're working uh, with them in the eye. Uh, Sarapta, uh, of course, is, is focused in the muscle. Uh, Roche Group is uh, together with Spark, as I mentioned, um, working with them in both the CNS and the liver. And then Acellus is our most recent partnership uh, working with them in the muscle. And I already talked more about why we want to work with so many uh, different partners, why and why we chose these ones and they chose us uh, at the beginning uh, stage of the company and in the long term, how we want to be the partner of choice for everyone uh, in gene delivery and, and also enable more companies to make better products um, to help more patients. I'd love to, to dig a little bit deeper here. And, and how do you deal with uh, failure in, in these type, this type of partnership model? Uh, and how do you de-risk these types of partnerships? Yeah, well, um, I guess one of the principles I thought about when we were working on these and kind of defining the structure as well as I think it's a good principle in general is you want to design a structure where there's a very high likelihood of success. Um, so obviously there's going to be risks anytime you do science uncertainties, um, but can we come up with a structure that enables us to ultimately succeed no matter what like course might, uh, might be taken. Uh, for example, we would, can we do a partnership with a very ambitious goal? Well, you know, there's, there's good reason to aim uh, for ambitious goals, but that also means we may not know exactly how long it'll take for us to achieve that, right? We can certainly like assess progress by seeing gradual improvement, but if we set a very specific deadline by which we need to achieve this goal, then it might be that things are going really well. It's just that it's gonna take longer. So, um, you know, trying to design the flexibility into the partnership to account for things like that is, is one thing that I thought about, especially in the early days when we're still a bit of the platform as we go. As we get more and more experience, we also are, you know, getting better at predicting exactly how it's going to work and what improvement we're going to see and um, how long it will take for that to happen. Um, ultimately, it'll get even simpler too when we have more and more capsids that are, you know, have come out of work we've done in the past, we can offer them to partners ready to go, so-called like off the shelf, or maybe they've already been in clinical trials in other disease areas and, you know, partner wants to use it in some new area. Um, so that's also what's really exciting about capsids is you can reuse them, same capsid, but different payload to go treat a completely new disease, um, which is also quite unique. Many proteins, that protein, you know, is to treat a specific disease, but capsids are modular, uh, which is another reason why I was so excited about using them because you can get so much from even a single uh, uh, single capsid. Yeah, that's awesome. Josephine has her hand raised. Yeah, I have a question on, so within your partnership models, these five are all pretty large pharmaceutical companies. So I'm, I'm wondering, do you partner with smaller companies? What are the opportunities for them? And also, um, is this more, I'm guessing it's more of a, for example, you design, you get a capsid design and since you can also apply it to multiple disease indications, how do you, do you get some like milestone payments or royalties when the product eventually gets approved by the FDA or is there more also a fee-for-service kind of model that you also have operating within the company? We've always thought about the work we do as we're building a platform. And in fact, we're very well funded to do that. Uh, we don't need to partner in order to build a platform, but uh, we do want to help a lot of patients. And you know that's the reason why we partner, because we can multiply their effectiveness and we can partner very broadly. Um, so I, th I think that answers the last question. The I'm trying to think of what there were a few others that were that were in there in the beginning. Can you just tell me you remember those, Josephine? Yeah, I think that the second one was then, do you, what are the opportunities for smaller emerging gene therapy companies to partner with you as well? These are large pharma companies. So do you have any of those ongoing too? Yeah, so again, we're trying to find the right balance between commitment, experience, um, and like insights that we can gain from the partnership. That That's why we chose these. And it just happens that, you know, 
solving for that combination ended up bringing us to some of the more experienced larger players. Um, it also was helpful for signing deals, which could demonstrate the value of this platform approach. Again, because I mentioned that was a question investors had early on, like this model is different than what I'm used to. So how do I know that this is really going to work? So working with very experienced folks enabled us to build a lot of credibility. We signed the first three partnerships and then we're in a very good position to fundraise. So we, we closed our Series A last year. It was led by a really great uh, VC, uh, Andreessen Horowitz. They're one of the most experienced kind of tech bio investors. Um, and this, those first deals are really important for showing to them, yeah, there's a really great opportunity here and this could be really big. Let's go faster to do that. And then we're gonna share in the value that we create. So, you know, now with those funds, we're even less in need of say upfront payments. So we could work with folks uh, like on the earlier stage startups who uh, might be um, willing to share more of the downstream value with us in exchange for lower uh, upfront terms. So again, that was part of our um, pitch to the investors was, you know, we have these partnerships, we could continue to grow do more partnerships or we could work with you, we could use your funds to advance the science, go faster and then do more deals and deals that maximize for business value rather than having a constraint say in the deal terms. So, and that was very effective again uh, to those investors to, uh, to get them excited about joining our team. Yeah, awesome, I, Brian has his hand raised. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. Sorry. Um, that was a great explanation. It made me think of, of partnerships a little bit further. And um, what, what are the, maybe the reasons why you might be hesitant to partner with uh, kind of an ex vivo cell therapy company? Is it mostly because AAV does not have the, um, the it has limitations on, on the size of payloads that it can package. And a lot of big payloads like chimeric antigen receptors, um, you know, don't fit well into the AAV platform. Can you speak a little to why cell therapies are not currently a partner? Well, it's, I wouldn't say why cell therapies aren't currently a partner, um, more so that the, the, the folks who are most interested in partnering with Dino are the ones who are focused on the in vivo work, certainly because that's where the challenges are very uh, high. Like it's, it's hard to do in vivo gene therapy at all unless you're using a capsid mediated delivery, where are, whereas there are some alternatives for how to get into cells if you're able to do that. Um, delivery ex vivo. I, but at the same time, there are there are many people using AV to deliver uh, genes um, ex vivo in vitro. So we're not. Um, there's no reason why we wouldn't want to work with them uh, if we can offer something uh, you know compelling with our platform. Then you know they're certainly within the set of patient uh, patient focused organizations that we want to help. Um, Again, to prove the thesis of Dino, which was you know key to um, growing the company, it, it made sense to like think about what's our target market, what's like the core of that, and that's kind of what led to our focus for these early partnerships. But there's there's nothing to exclude working with uh, many people using AV. In fact, I'm always excited when I um, hear about some new research paper or some some new therapy that uses AVs in new ways because everything we can do to make AV more useful or learn how to use it better uh, is just great for Dino and great for the field. Uh, awesome. I, I, I do wonder with this type of business model where you're, you're forming these partnerships, is there a ceiling to the scalability there where you know that you can't go beyond so many partners or how do you manage that? No, I think it's the opposite. I think it's more scalable than developing your own products. Like um, if it's much easier to go from 10 licenses to 100 than it would be to go from one product to 10. Um, so it's, you know, in, in that sense, the platform is more like a tech company, like for example, software as a service, it's a really great business because it scales very well. You develop the, the product, but then selling more units is just, you know, um, it's very easy to spin that up. And same thing for licenses. Once you have the capsid made, Licensing it to a few more people is just, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's much lower cost than developing the capsule itself. So 
that leads to high margins, like higher profit margins. Um, and then in general, what makes platforms most successful or most dominant is the higher the margin, the more you can reinvest those revenues in the improvement of the platform. So you tend to get like a takeoff effect for platforms because they, they have this um, like network effect built into the business model. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, Jonathan, you wanna continue our conversation? Sure, yeah. I'm um, now just to take a look at the competitive landscape, like Eric mentioned, there seems like a, a bunch of new AV companies uh, coming out. Um, I focused on just companies that were uh, similarly trying to optimize AVs, but I, I think there are other ways of gene delivery um, that I'm sure other people in the group uh, might want to comment on. Um, and the three companies I want to highlight here first are Affinia Therapeutics, which describes uh, a very similar process to Dino of designing libraries of novel capsids, tracking the performance of AVs and experiments with barcodes read out by next-gen sequencing and then analyzing the data with machine learning algorithms to iteratively update their, their designs, um, looking to optimize tissue targeting and cell type specificity, uh, magnitude of transduction expression, packaging efficiency, immunological profile, and manufacturing yields. Um, similar, those are, I think, the, the kind of five categories that Eric described earlier. Um, the second here is Stride Bio, which their kind of seemingly unique um, take on it was starting with cryo EM data of antibody interacting domains on the AAV capsid to um, try to uh, use that, I guess, uh, more rational design approach to um, limit the immunogenicity of the AAV capsid um, and then undergo rounds of in vivo evolution to assess capsid variants, which evade uh, antibody interactions best. Um, and then last, I'll highlight uh, Regenex Biosciences, whose platform um, has exclusive rights to, uh, they describe many novel AV vectors, which they've generated to optimize application across disease states, delivering different uh, types of genetic material, simplified manufacturing, uh, making AVs less immunogenic and improved gene expression. Um, and I think comparing those companies to what makes Dino unique, the thing that kind of struck me that Eric's touched on a few times was just the, all those companies are also trying to develop their own therapies, it seems, whereas Dino is really taking that approach of focusing on, um, uh, you know, AAV optimization and par partnering with established gene therapy companies. Um, and that's, was really what seemed to me to make Dino unique, but I guess maybe I'll, pass it back to Eric to maybe he can touch on what what he thinks makes Dino unique compared to those other competitors. Yeah, thanks. It's a great setup. It's great questions. Um, I, I, I thought about these things a lot. So I was uh, starting out and, you know, asking myself, is there a, an interesting uh, opportunity here for impact? Is there a potential business? Uh, Regenix actually, when they started, was almost like Dino today. It was a pure platform. They we're really pioneering and developing this idea of a vector platform. Um, came out of these vectors came out of Jim Wilson's lab um, at UPenn. And what was interesting is that um, they were kind of too early, and that at the time in which they developed this platform business model, there were not many companies doing gene therapy. It was during a period in which it wasn't a very popular thing to do. Um, so if you compare, for example, the deals that Regenix did back then with the ones they did 10 years later, or even the ones that are more you know, newsworthy now, it's just like orders of an orders of magnitude different in the, the value of those deals. Um, as it happened, they pivoted into developing their own products once they had kind of seeded the field of uh, early gene therapy companies and established the value of those capsids. And uh, nowadays they're more product focused. I think they missed the window to like bring new technologies into the platform. Um, they still have, you know, some great vectors, but uh, in terms of the next gen engineered vectors and synthetic capsids, um, uh, others started working on that um, prior to them and I think are, you know, today more advanced. The um, Stripe Bio and Affinia are really interesting because I, I really uh, learned a lot from the academic uh, co-founders of those companies, um, in particular, Finia, started by Luke Vandenberg. Um, and there was a really interesting paper on ancestral reconstruction 
Uh, as I mentioned, that's that's incorporating data from the phylogeny into the design of capsids that came out uh, close to when Dino was started. And that's one of the things that I mentioned made me feel like, oh, if that data was valuable or you know that information was valuable, then having even more from data itself would, would be even better. Uh, we just got to figure out a way to learn how to use it. And that, that's the machine learning angle. Uh, and Stride Bio 2 um, started by Arvin Asukan and Mavis uh, Agbanji McKenna. Uh, and again, they, they showed like the unique value of structure, structural information at improving the efficiency of design. Um, and so the thing about those two approaches, which made me feel like there was something new still to do is that the phylogeny is what it is. Like there's a certain number of sequences, it's not really changing, right? It changes a little bit every year, but it's not like orders of magnitude different every year. Um, same thing with the structures. There's a lot of structures out there, more added every year, but um, I kind of felt like there was a static amount of data that these companies or these, these efforts were leveraging. Eventually they became companies and what was, knew that I saw based upon the work I did from my PhD was just how powerful the measurement technology was going to be and how that would enable us to get large amounts of data. And then every data set would enable you to see further out into the sequence space and then go into newly uh, new areas, areas that had never been explored before. So that's a really unique opportunity because similar to the network effects on the business model, the better data you have, the more you learn how to make better AVs. So the better experience you are, the more you go into new areas and get even better data. So you get this, this flywheel effect. Um, and that's why I think it's gonna you know, become the dominant approach for any type of protein engineering. You, you could say the original strategy for Dino was find the most impactful protein because this is gonna happen everywhere. And, and so just choose the area where it's most important and focus on that and at least like do a good job there, then expand to other areas. And that, that's still something think about probably we'll do more than capsid Sunday at Dino, but we're, we're really focused on having the most impact first, learning how to do machine guided design really well, and then taking those lessons and more quickly expanding and by applying them outside of capsids. Oh, sorry, we have a question from Edward. Hi, I'm Barton. I'm a, I'm a PhD candidate at UCSD. Um, I had a quick question on when you think about your competitive landscape um, beyond the AAVs, do you feel like AAVs kind of have a limited window in time, or is this kind of a, or is this indefinitely going to be the solution here? And how does that kind of inform, inform your strategy? I think every everything in science has a limited window of time, um, but I think the time scale in which AAVs are going to be useful is pretty long. You know, many decades. One, because the the products are approved and they will, you know. They'll be generating revenues for new patients, say, who are born with uh, with diseases, or or even it, I think in the near future, we're going to be treating uh, non-genetic conditions more commonly with gene therapy. And so there's people are just going to develop those indications, um, uh, those diseases, say, later in life. And uh, you know, very large populations of uh, patients will still be looking for gene therapies. And you know, if AV does the job well. You know, if it's effective, if it's safe, if it's affordable, then it's going to be hard to displace it, even if something you know better comes along. Um, it's, it's hard to you know it's hard to step away from a platform that works and that's been like demonstrated to be effective in so many cases, which is I think what's going to happen with AV. It's why it's already the most popular way of doing in vivo delivery. Awesome. We have another question from Uzga. Oops, yeah, sorry. So I'm just wondering about like uh, how your life has changed as a scientist. Now you are an entrepreneur and holding a, a CEO seat. And I imagine that your um, uh, your time is very limited to maybe like uh, do more science, but uh, you have other operational roles. Could you please like uh, tell us about uh, this, your role? Yeah, um, I would say it's changed in that I've, I've found some really amazing uh, team members who are amazing scientists, and I trust them uh, to kind of continue expanding the the cutting edge of of science, and they're excited about that. And I, I just do what I can in order to help them. Um, and that, that's just been a choice I had to make. Like, do I want to focus more on the science and the business? And in choosing the CEO role, decided to uh, focus more on the business. Um, but I still enjoy science. I, I love getting the updates. I love seeing new data. It's just I, um, 
uh, I don't participate in the like driving it forward uh, as much as I did prior to starting the company. Michael and Anjali. Hi, thank you. Um, so very quickly, because I know we're, we're short on time. I'm Anjali, I'm a PhD student at Yale. Um, and uh, I, I also uh, design educational initiatives uniquely. It's so lovely to have you here. Um, so non-viral uh, methods have been brought up twice, I think, in this conversation. So I just kind of wanted to dig in there a little bit more um, with, particularly with, you know, COVID vaccines having used this, for, like predominantly LMPs uh, and, you know, places like Generation, Generation Bio. Um, what are your thoughts about, um, are you sort of thinking about you know, in a, a niche in, in the market that, you know, is, is very readily served by AAVs. And obviously we have the considerations of, um, you know, AAVs can be designed in ways given that they're proteins uh, differently than, than LNPs. So just wanted to, to get your thoughts on that. Well, I think that in vivo delivery is a challenge and, um, no, I'd be excited about any new technology that might offer some promise uh, to help. I am most excited about AVs because you know they're already the the most effective way to go into organs, not just the liver, but you know body wide uh, today. LNPs, at least historically, uh, have been more successful in the liver, and even in, then, there's some challenges about. Um, you know, getting into all the cells. Um, many, many people have worked to expand LMPs from the liver into other organs. And um, I'm not an expert in, or an expert chemist, so uh, I, I can't say it'll never be done. Um, but I've just seen a lot of people try and, uh, and not make as much progress as I think they hoped they would. Um, so AVs are already, I would, you know, uh, argue just based upon how many, how much people rely on them today, the leading way to deliver uh, genes outside the liver. And what's also really exciting about AVs, because they're protein, is we can apply all these genetic technologies, which enable us to say, test libraries and measure their output and think about like changes to the protein machine, making it better, kind of it's, it's more of an active uh, effort to go into a cell because you're using proteins than it would be to use a LNP, which is more of a kind of chemical uh, passive approach to get into uh, uh, the target organ. So those technologies are also getting better and better. We're able to synthesize more variants. We're able to sequence you know, cheaper and larger libraries. We're able to apply machine learning at greater meter scales. So I really like that nexus of technologies coming together and you know it's why why we bet on uh proteins and capsids and an av in particular uh to focus our efforts on on new technology that's awesome jonathan if you want to kind of um uh, bring us to this last slide on safety and and evaluating that sure yeah um i i for in terms of safety concerns i wanted to raise this one because i was kind of surprised by it um there was a paper came out, I guess, two years ago now in Nature Biotech that looked at this. Um, they were treating dogs uh, with this AAV for uh, uh, gene therapy for hemophilia. And um, after a certain amount of time that I forget now, found kind of widespread and spread integration of the, of the therapy into the genome and preferentially into endogenous genes. Um, and, you know, when we learn about AAVs, the kind of first thing we learn is not integrating or if they integrate very rarely in like very specific sites. Um, so I was surprised by this result and wanted to get the thoughts of, uh, you know, an expert in the AAV field um, and maybe a discussion from other people in the group about broader safety concerns regarding AAVs. Well, Maybe, maybe I'll share my opinion. I would love to hear what others feel. Um, I, I think we should obviously be very prudent and, and thoughtful about safety, especially anytime you're gonna do a clinical trial to help people, you need to put safety first. Um, so I, these studies are interesting. I think there's a lot we don't know about AV. Actually, you saw that in the science paper, right? There was a whole gene that we didn't know about in the capsid and we, we found it you know, by accident. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot more to learn. Uh, 
I'm sure we're going to learn things about AV that enable us to make gene therapy safer. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that as soon as we understand um, what it is, uh, you know, for example, that causes this effect that we can also use engineering to, to make it better. So I, I really, uh, you know, I'm all for basic research and helping us understand not just AV, but, you know, the general, you know, natural biology uh, of, of paraviruses. And I think there's going to be a lot of interesting applications of that. Um, what I can say is that many things we're doing already today at Dino are going to make AV safer. For example, like we, we make the efficient, uh, the delivery more efficient. And that enables us to be more targeted, say, to the cells that benefit from the therapy, avoiding any off-target cells where say there was integration or say there was some um, uh, risk of side effects because of a high dose, the more we can detarget other organs, the safer it's going to be. And the more efficient it is, the lower dose we can use to have an effective therapy. So that's already going to make a big difference, I think, uh, for patients making better AV gene therapies that are effective and also just um, have lower risk of, of any side effect. Yeah, thank you so much, Eric. I think for time, um, this is a great place to kind of wrap up our discussion on, on just the incredible value and um, exciting future of dyno and, and, um, and gene therapies. Um, thank you all so much uh, for joining, um, just to be respectful of time. Um, if you have any more questions, if it's okay, Eric, if, if they don't mind, uh, if, if people could uh, email you if they have any, any really uh, pending questions that they didn't get to ask. Um, sure. And, Feel free. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, everyone, for all the great questions and great discussion. It was great uh, to, to be with you all. Take care. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Fun to meet. Bye.